Good morning, everybody. So here we are, the end of our journey through Ephesians. If Paul has been giving us the message here in this last part, he's giving us the means, he's encouraging us, he's showing us what we have to do and be if we're going to bring this message alive and change the world. And all God's people shall say, Amen. Amen. Yes. So, let's have the first one if we could. So, Paul begins this last section with these words. Finally, brothers and sisters, draw your strength and your might from God. This is getting to the real centre of Paul's faith and his yearning for the church and for us. Draw your strength, your might, everything you are, draw it from God. Anybody recognise the sculpture? Uh -huh. There's going to be some visits to Coventry Cathedral happening, I think. So this is uh, Coventry Cathedral. It's by the American sculptor Helen Huntington Jennings. And it is of Christ crucified. For me, capturing the moment of his death. And it's a sculpture in steel. It's welded. And the steel comes from a car crash. It's a car in which lives were lost. And the sculptor has taken that steel, that tragedy, that catastrophe, and has made this statement, powerful statement, out of it. A statement of belief which sits alongside Paul's statement that in everything we draw our strength and might from God who overcame death and evil and wickedness and everything that we have to face and rose triumphant for all time. So Paul frames our understanding of message and means and who we should be with the death and resurrection of Jesus. We know that because Ephesians is shot through with that, isn't it? That great confidence in God's power and God's love. And so here, in his final message to these people in Ephesus, Paul is saying, draw your strength and your might from God. Are you up for it? Ooh. Not sure if that was strength and might, or whether that was maybe, perhaps, I'll see how it pans out. But actually, when you've been through the hard times, when you've been through the struggle, as Paul has, and remember, he's writing from imprisonment. Rome has put him away. Think what he's been through. Think of his journey. Think of the struggle. Then think of your own struggle. Your own battles, all that life has thrown at you, all of your self-doubt, your lack of self-worth, the difficult people you've had to deal with, or everything, the unexpected things that life puts in your way. And you understand this, don't you? I do. That actually when the chips are down, it is a given that we can draw our strength and might from God. So this really matters to Paul. It's a defining statement of his theology, his spirituality, of who he is, that in everything, that's what he does. And it doesn't let him down. We're not talking PPI insurance, folks. You're not being missold. This is trustworthy and true. Because this comes from the man who in his letter to the church in Rome basically says absolutely categorically that nothing but nothing but nothing in life or death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord, doesn't he? That's the depth of faith you've got here. And it's the depth of faith that the world needs from the church, says Paul. This is who we need to be, sisters and brothers. So the next one. It's a bit like me looking at myself in the mirror when I get up. 
And so he lays it out as to how deep the challenge is. Now, this is a, a grotesque from St. Peter's Parish Church in Winchcombe, down in Gloucestershire. It has 40 of these on it, 40 of them. The wonder is, and the sense of humour is, at least some of them represent townspeople and villagers from the time. <laughs> Never offend a sculptor would be the message. But why do you think that parish church is festooned with gargoyles that represent demons? What is going on? Why did they do it when it was built, do you think? A realistic threat, Chris, absolutely. They were wanting to warn the community that they were under threat that the darkness would try and overcome them and consume them. And as the church who believes passionately, as we read in the first chapter of John's Gospel, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has never overcome it. That that message was needed in a time when life was under threat and it was difficult, it was hard, it was a struggle and the forces of evil and wickedness were very apparent. And so Paul is saying to the infant church, protect yourselves from the devil and his evil schemes. And the presenting issues that led him to say that, the things he saw in people's lives and in the communities he served and in society and the world are the same presenting issues we see now. Now, some might want to explain them differently, but they are exactly the same presenting issues. People's lives in turmoil, their minds in chaos, relationships destroys, people oppressed, evil and wickedness abounding, seeking to consume, keep out, destroy, diminish. Does that ring bells as you look at the news and you think about the world we live in and we think of our own lives? It's a real and present danger, says Paul, one you recognise and one the church has recognised down the centuries and wants to warn us about. Next one, if you will, Chris. Let's read that together, shall we? The devil is poised to pounce and would like nothing better than to catch you napping. That's from the message translation. It's great, isn't it? And look at the demon ready to pounce. What the church is saying what Paul is emphasising is that evil and wickedness are real and present and we have to be on our guard and we have to stand up against them, against the darkness, against all that would destroy. Next one, if you will, Chris. That's a particularly gruesome one, isn't it? And gruesome for a reason. Absolutely. <laughs> That's just the sort of noise <laughs> to you, devil. <laughs> That's what that prayer is doing. We haven't worked together before. We must do it again. <laughs> For centuries, the church has prayed this prayer. It's from night prayer. It's from Compline. So in convents and monasteries and churches down the centuries... At night time, this has been a prayer that's been prayed. Why would you pray that unless you needed to, unless the threat were real? You wouldn't, would you? But the threat is real. Evil and wickedness are tangible. Save us, O Lord, while waking and guard us while sleeping. And it's that sense of reality and urgency that Paul is putting in front of the church because he knows that the powers of darkness, on a cosmic scale, he says, will stop at nothing to frustrate the church in its mission of bringing God's love and God's hope to those who most need it. And he knows what it is to be under attack. The next one, if we could. 
I'll give you the cue when to laugh. <laughs> so he says, you need to be head to toe in the full armour of God. What do you see? Who are this lot? Yeah. Cuddly, fluffy, nice. Good bit of satirical, whimsy laughter. What Paul does next is stunning. Having stood firm in the gospel and in the death and resurrection of Jesus, having named the evil and the wickedness as a present threat, the image he uses is satire writ large. It's brave, it's bold, it's breathtaking. Remember, this is a guy who's sitting in prison, a Roman prison surrounded by Roman soldiers. <laughs> This is someone who is recalling that these were the people that put Jesus to death because he was a revolutionary and they executed him and they thought they crushed him and they tried to crush his movement. And they wouldn't stop trying to crush it until 305 when Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. And many would argue neutered it. But he is looking at this reality of brutality and evil. If you're not a citizen of Rome, you don't count. Heaven help you if you stand up for what you believe in because you know what this lot are going to do to you. The Roman imperial empire with all its might seeking to dominate and rule and what Paul does, he looks at that and he mocks it. And he subverts it. And he undermines it. And he says the gospel is stronger than this. So the image he is using is this image. He says, put on the full armour of God, not that. Don't trust in that. That will get you nowhere. That will take you to the darkness. That will take your life. What I'm offering you will save it. Next one, Chris, if we could. And there is this, this great, fantastic subversion of Roman might and power and authority in what he then says. And thinking of these people who murdered Jesus, he says, okay, stand yourselves with truth around your waist. Truth is the first thing, he says, we stand upon. So let me ask you, how easy do you find it to tell the truth? Oh, dear. How, it depends on the context. So you've got the boss you really can't stand and you think is a real prize idiot. <laughs> do you tell them? No. No. You've got the minister who you think blathers on too much. Do you tell me? No. Your partner does something that re really annoys you. Are you honest? You just come out and say, <laughs> Sometimes, Shirley. Sometimes. That was Shirley. It is recorded for all time that that was Shirley. But speaking the truth isn't easy, is it? And yet Paul says, that's the first thing we have to do. We have to stand on it, we have to speak it, we have to challenge, we have to say, this is our truth. And by the light of our truth, what you are doing is evil, is wicked, is cruel, is hurtful, is diminishing, is undermining. We stand on the truth. And boy, does the world need churches that stand on the truth, don't we? Just at the moment. And then he says, yes, you stand on the truth of who Jesus is, risen, ascended, victor over evil, crusher and vanquisher of the devil and the powers of darkness. You stand on that truth with righteousness as your chest plate protecting you. In other words, the right living of God's kingdom. Being to each other as God is to us. Loving one another. The heart of Jesus' message we bind to ourselves proudly 
and saying so the world can see it, because righteousness is how you live your life, not what you think up here, it's how you live your life. He's saying, be truthful and live it as you say it. So the next time you're in one of those difficult conversations, <laughs> indeed, it's a challenge, isn't it? Because it's only by confronting that which is wrong that we can change it into that which is hopeful and right, says Paul. And proclaim the good news of peace. This is what Ephesians has been about. The good news that everybody is included. The good news of God's love for everybody that sets us free. That Jesus is risen from death. We have nothing to fear. Paul is saying, proclaim it. Proclaim the good news. So what does that look like where you and I are? What is it to proclaim the good news in a way that sets others free through our thinking, our believing, our being and raise the shield of faith to extinguish the flaming spears hurled at you from the wicked one? There's going to be some interesting conversations this week with you and those who might be your bosses. Stop hurling those flaming spears at me, would you? Just stop. Stop. See me as I am. But there is confidence there, isn't there? That actually our faith can stop and resist everything that is hurled at us that would destroy us, degrade us, diminish us, harm us that our faith in Jesus is true and nothing we have to face will destroy us because we have that understanding of salvation from Jesus which is for all of us and the power of the Spirit which is the Word of God. And he's doing this, subverting Rome into the bargain. He's looking at the real and present danger of that power, that imperial power, and is saying, you think you've got it? You think you've got the best weapons? You think you're going to dominate the world? Think again, because what we have is stronger than anything you can imagine. An act of amazing subversion and confidence from Paul. Next one, if we could, Chris. And then he gets to the heart of it, and he says, look, be fully prepared to hold your ground. Do not give way. Sorry. That naughty man shouting. Oh, bless. And we all need a cuddle. That's the thing. That's what he understands. Be fully prepared to hold your ground in the face of everything we are challenged by. Let me give you two. What it is, is it as a church who believes in the power of Jesus and the love of God for everybody and the gift of the world as God's creation meant for everyone as an inheritance? What is it to hold our ground on climate change, the single greatest threat to the security of our planet that we've ever faced? What is it to hold our ground? Well, you ask a 16-year-old from Sweden and they'll tell you. Greta, what has she done? Gone on strike. Did you see the news with the school strikes? The climate change? Isn't it brilliant? Young people get it. They look at that useless, hopeless, helpless mob in the House of Commons and they shame them. They couldn't take a decision for the life of them, that lot. And the planet's burning. And it's school children who are actually saying, we get it, it's our future, this matters. Prepared to hold their ground and shaming us into holding ours. This is God's creation, people. This is a gift from God. We have to stand up, stand out, hold our ground. And have you heard of Insectageddon? Well, some of us have. Who could tell me what Insectageddon is? It's not a Schwarzenegger movie, by the way. In case you're wondering. Extinction of insects. It's incredible. And it is a massive threat. 
because most of the world's ecosystems, unless you're looking or you live in a volcano or a hot spring, are dependent one way or another on insects. All of our agriculture is, by and large. And insects are declining at rates never seen before. Hence the term insects again. Due to what? Man-made activity, largely the dreadful pesticides which persist. This is a real present danger. And when you look at these dangers, and when you look beyond them to what's happening across the world, you see that when Paul talks about the devil and darkness and spiritual forces, they are at work. Whether they are embodied in big corporations or corrupt governments or people on the make, you decide. But we face challenges that Paul would have been aghast at. And he is saying, hold your ground, stand up for the truth, speak out with that gospel of peace and love and righteousness and don't budge on the things that matter. Because in all of these things, who gets hurt first? Who gets hurt worst? Who always suffers? The weak and the poor. And Jesus came with good news for? And the poor. Next one, Chris, if you would. And he ends this letter with this most amazing exhortation. Because he says, pray always, pray in the spirit, pray about everything, pray for everybody, but pray, 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 pray. That's the thing he wants them to take away at the end of this amazing letter. Pray. And you're probably wondering why you're looking at two photographs of a lift. Uh, they're not mine. But you're looking at two photographs of a lift because... Had it not been for the invention of the lift, there would be no skyscrapers. Yes, you learned something this morning, folks. Because you were limited to the amount of stairs, flights of stairs, you could walk up. Anybody ever tried to walk up the stairs at Hull Royal Infirmary? It's a killer, isn't it? I had to do it once, right to the 11th floor, never again. It's a miracle I'm still here. <laughs> oh, gosh. And then you go to visit somebody you know, as a minister, and you come in and go, <laughs> <laughs> How are you? <laughs> you expect to be offered a bed. <laughs> Lifts meant skyscrapers were possible. It meant we could rise above ground level. It meant we could rise up and we could see further than we had seen before. And that's the, what Paul understands. Prayer is like the elevator. It takes us up to those vistas, those views of the kingdom and life which God alone has for us. Prayer has power to elevate, to energize, to take us where we wouldn't otherwise go. And so being armed for the struggle, standing confident in Christ, Paul wants a church that will pray and pray and pray because prayer is powerful and prayer works. We started Ephesians with the vision of a gospel for everybody and we end it with the challenge and the means. So let's engage with the darkness. Let's stand firm as people of light. For the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has never overcome it. Let's pray. Let's pray. Help us to stand firm, to stand true, to stand righteous, to stand bold, to stand confident. We pray, O oh God, for you raised Jesus from the dead and you have defeated the powers of darkness wherever they are manifest. Draw us close to him and in the power of your spirit, 
release us to be who you need us to be, that the world would be saved through Christ. Amen. And my last one, Chris, if we could. That's the takeaway from this morning. These three things we need to be as church. Let's say them together. Finally, brothers and sisters, draw your strength and might from God. Be fully prepared to hold your ground. Pray always. Pray in the Spirit. Amen.